So you all be doing that too when you're doing your presentation. So welcome to the uh, uh, communications history class or history of media class. And uh, as I said, my name's Ken Harvey. Um, let me uh, do a little bit of introduction uh, of myself and also my educational approach. I want you to understand what it is that I, uh, why I do the things I do, so to speak. Um, you can call me, uh, you know, my last name, the family name is actually Harvey, but Harvey's a little bit hard for some people to pronounce. Uh, and so over the years, uh, as I've worked overseas, I've just let people call me Dr. Ken. Uh, it is uh, important, though, that you understand that my last name is Harvey because you're going to be doing some writing and referring to me. In the writing, you should refer to me as Dr. Harvey. Uh, but in here, you can refer to me as Dr. Ken. That's easier. Okay, so just understand the difference, because um, we're going to be using journalistic style in our writing, and journalistic style is to refer to, after the introduction, Dr. Ken Harvey. Then after that, you actually refer to them in journalism, at least in Western journalism, as just Harvey. Um, some newspapers, some media, change that rule slightly for themselves, but the Associated Press, which uh, kind of creates the Bible of journalism, um, says just call them by their last name. So when you're writing about me, you just uh, the first time you'll say, according to Dr. Ken Harvey or Professor Ken Harvey, whatever. And then the second time you refer to me, you just say, Harvey said. You know, Harvey did this, Harvey said that. You just refer me by my family name. But for our purposes, uh, I don't even care if you just call me Ken. I know some people are kind of... Um, reluctant to just call me by my first name. Um, and I know that probably some of you in particular in this part of the world, you're even more reluctant than students, in fact, probably much more reluctant than students in America would be. Um, but I think of myself actually more as a professional than a pro professor. Uh, I've been a newspaper editor and publisher most of my life and, and other things like that. And if I went into a newsroom, uh, even if I were the boss, even as a publisher, and I said, by the way, from now on, you refer to me as Dr. Harvey, I would probably get thrown out a window. Okay? Um, and in fact, in my research, I found that uh, uh, in getting a job, the executives, uh, media executives, do not want to hire somebody with a PhD. They would, even if everything else is equal, if they have to choose between somebody with a PhD and a master's degree, they will hire the person with a master's degree. So if I ever decide I want to go back into industry, my PhD will not be on my CV. Um, so, as I said, there's kind of a prejudice against people, uh, not only who say want to call themselves Dr. Harvey, uh, but even those with it on their CV. They don't want anybody with a doctor in front of their name on their staff. And so, being a more of a professional than a professor, uh, I do not mind at all if people call me Ken, because that's how I would be referred to. Also, another reason why I don't mind if you call me Ken is because I see our process here as a group process. Uh, as I mentioned, you're going to help teach the class. Uh, you're going to write about the class. We're going to talk about it. You're going to actually get... Uh, one part of your grade will be whether you're discussing things in class. I'm going to call on you individually. That's one reason why I want to make sure I know how to call your name. I'm going to be calling on you individually and asking you a question once in a while. It may only be, you know, five or six times during the semester, but you don't know when. I'm going to call on you. That means you better prepare, uh, but it also means your answers are going to be important, and I'm going to walk around, if I can get this to work, and stick it under your mouth here, and you're going to have to talk onto the computer, and what you say is going to be in our video. So we're participating in this learning process together, because I believe that's the best way to do it. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a second, too. So I don't, you know, again, um, Ken or Dr. Ken, I don't care, whatever you feel comfortable comfortable both calling me uh, is okay with me. Okay? Hey you is okay. Uh, I have lots of experience. Um, about 25 years in journalism. 
uh, 18 years in teaching higher education, seven years in, uh, in, in completing a bilingual uh, uh, newspaper and bilingual education, reporting on it and working at it. Um, seven years in corporate marketing as a PR and, and marketing PR director, four years as a government official, one year in broadcasting, five years in book publishing, 20 years in web creation and management, but I'm not really 100 years old. Uh, I am a workaholic, and so frequently I'm doing more than one thing at once. Uh, I have a number of web pages I produce and maintain now while I'm doing this job, um, and I'm, I'm always busy with something, but not too busy to talk to you, by the way. Um, you are my first priority, so if you need to talk to me, come talk to me, and we'll go into that a little bit in a second. Uh, this was a, I mentioned bilingual, this is Spanish-English uh, newspaper that I put out under contract with the state of Washington. Um, I have uh, been a publisher, editor and publisher of a weekly newspaper. This one we turned into uh, more of a magazine style, but it was still a weekly newspaper. We decided to, well, kind of like uh, what's the star kind of have as a magazine front compared to a lot of newspapers. And so that's what we did also with this one, Tri-City Citizen. Um, also, uh, I ran this uh, entertainment magazine, uh, monthly magazine. Um, also do online blogging. This is a blog site of mine. More than just a blog site because I also, one of my com concerns about uh, America right now is that the, the, the country has become very politicized and very polarized. And part of the reason why they're being polarized is that the internet allows us to do something that's bad. And that is only hear what we want to hear. Uh, if you only hear what you want to hear, you're only going to think what you want to think, and you're not going to understand the other side at all. Uh, now, I have a hard time understanding the other side. You know, I have my opinions, but I, but on my website, I have news, news, uh, you know, news coming in as RSS feeds from newspapers I and and uh, TV. Uh, networks that I disagree with in a lot of things, and I have uh, sources coming in on RSS feeds from conservative uh, uh, sources, which I consider myself uh, conservative, uh, by West, by American standards. That, by the way, isn't consistent. Um, uh, in the previous nine years, I've worked in Kazakhstan. In Kazakhstan, I'm definitely a, li a liberal uh, because of the nature of the government. My and here I'd probably be a liberal. Uh, here in Malaysia, I, I'm not as familiar with uh, Malaysian politics, but I would probably still uh, be considered a liberal here. Maybe a little more moderate. I'm not sure. But in America, I'm a conservative. Um, my primary definition of it, and not exclusively, but my primary de uh, definition of conservative or liberal relates to how much government there is. In America, those who want less government are conservatives. In Kazakhstan, those who want more government, um, who want more government, are considered conservative, because they're holdovers from the communist system and so forth, and so government controlled everything. And so the conservatives who want to conserve what they had before uh, want more government. So it's actually the total opposite definition, or opposite reality, so to speak, in you know, I want, I want less government in, in, in America that makes me a conservative. In Kazakhstan, that makes me a liberal because I want free speech. I want free press. I want free religion. I want, you know, all that. Um, here, partly because the government isn't quite as, uh, you know, quite as powerful, I guess, uh, as in Kazakhstan. Again, I might be a little more moderate. So it kind of depends where I'm at. So that term, conservative, liberal, means different things depending on where you live and what you're doing. Um, in America, I'm considered conser conservative. Um, so anyway, I do a blog. Um, not as regularly as I'd like to. Actually, I end up doing my blogging on Facebook, and I never get around to transferring it over to my site. I want to do that more. I've done book publishing over the years, uh, published over 100 books. Uh, um, and these are just a couple that uh, also were bilingual. These were in English and Russian, uh, these books were. Um, I co-authored this book recently with one of our 
Well, a professor who was here, he, in fact, he's the one that got me to come, and then he left. Um, but uh, anyway, he was the editor of it, and we had gotten to know each other uh, prior to that, and, and he recruited me to uh, help co-author this book, which is basically, uh, I, I hate its name, by the way, Human Social Inter Interaction in the Age of Mobile Devices. I hate that name. I tried to get him to change that name. Nobody wants to read that book. But if you say something like impact of web and, web and mobile technologies and all aspects of, of society and economy, they might want to read that. And that's what it is. That's what the book is about, is about the impact of web and, and mobile. It really, he wanted to emphasize mobile because he's a mobile expert. Um, but uh, it's very difficult to write uh, to separate the two on some issues. And so in the subject that I talked about, uh, education, for example, it's not just mobile. It's, there's not enough research on mobile by itself, but by covering both uh, web and mobile, since both of them are innovative in this day and age, both web-based educa web education and mobile education are both cutting edge today. Um, mobile is more cutting edge than, than web, granted. Um, and then another one was on local news and what the uh, future of, of local news uh, is uh, in America, but con I think consequently in all parts of the world. Uh, branding, public relations, business, advertising, and I see um, some of it uh, disappeared here. I, didn't, I thought it was all in there, but it disappeared. Let's make it a little smaller. Ah. So uh, let's go to anyway. So covering those subjects. So that's an area of of increasing interest to me. I became extremely interested in it when Barack Obama became president of the United States because he used the media in such a way, the social media in such a way, he would never have been president without social media, without his uh, his team's ability to use social media. He ultimately won by four percentage points, or if there had been a four percentage point change, let me put it that way, he would not have been president. And his background is much more liberal than than the average American. But the independents in the center are kind of easy to sway. And uh, so they're swayed by charisma. They're swayed by I don't know, anything exciting. And so the idea of having a black president, they didn't really consider his his history of, of politics. He's very quite liberal. Um, but he, and he won by a relatively little amount. But the way he was able to use social media, he he got more money in social media than his opponent McCain got in all of his donations. And so he ended up, Barack Obama ended up with twice as much money. Uh, McCain would have set a record, by the way. He would have, if, if he were not running against somebody smarter than him, I guess, um, McCain would have set a record for the most political donations to run his campaign. And he had half as much money as Barack Obama. So if you have $8 billion, not $8 billion, $800 million, like Barack Obama did, you can do a lot of campaigning if your opponent only has four hundred million dollars, and so as I said, that the his advantages plus his understanding of social media allowed him to um, to innovate or to energize his his followers. He was already charismatic and already had a, a fan base who were really fans in the truest sense, fanatics on his behalf. They were really excited for him. And so he could go on Facebook or another social media, and he could get he say, "Hey, we need your help today. We need you to go out and, and talk to your neighbors. Here, we, we can pick, you can get some flyers and hand them out to your neighbors." And they'd flock to get his flyers and hand them out to their neighbors. Uh, or when he did, when he wanted more money, eight hundred million wasn't enough. Uh, he could say, "Hey, we need another dollar, just ten dollars each, just to get us a little more money so we can win this election." And they'd flood in with their money. Um, so. He killed the Republicans uh, with his ability to use social media. So once I saw that, and once actually everybody in communications business saw what he did, we all said, uh-oh, 
we don't know anything anymore. Everything we thought we knew, we don't know anymore. Uh, because this guy just beat our pants off, or beat the pants off the Republicans. And the Republicans did a good job. He did an incredible job by using online media. And everything changed with his election. In the next year, um, I'm having to do this for memory. I didn't put it in this PowerPoint. In the next year, uh, Facebook, um, i trying to remember now, it more than doubled its number of, of users in the next year after he used it to win the election. And those, and Twitter users, I think, quadrupled, multiplied four times in one year after he used it to win his election. So everybody opened their eyes when they realized what was happening. So this is uh, cutting edge. I mean, it's it, the web is is still cutting edge. There's still a lot of people who don't know how to use the web uh, for uh, for marketing and for even for you know for news and so forth. A lot of people are still struggling with how to do it. Um, newspapers in America, for example, um, and this may be a subject I may share this with you in a PowerPoint in the future. Uh, newspapers in America have lost because of the internet, lost two-thirds of their advertising. Two-thirds of it. Um, and they've only increased their income from their online publications like that. <laughs> uh, it was uh, in 2002, I think it was, or 2003, American newspapers were already uh, getting uh, $3.1 billion in advertising. Uh, on for online advertising as of 2003 as of 2017 it's only 3.5 and that that does not come anywhere close to making up for the two-thirds of print advertising they've lost it's gone so they're all going broke and they don't know what to do about it they, they've been they've had the biggest experts try to help them um, and my my chapter tries to help them uh, they don't get it. They don't understand uh, how to deal with new, this new method of communication, how to compete with it. One thing they don't understand, I think, is who they're competing with. They st still, still think they're competing with each other, that newspapers are competing with newspapers and with TV stations. That's not who they're competing with. Where'd their advertising go? It didn't go to their, their, their media competitors and not their traditional media competitors. All their money went to Google and Facebook and Twitter and so forth. That's where their money went, their advertising money. So anyway, uh, so this is still uh, very important stuff. Uh, I also have a, um, I'm developing kind of an online TV station. It's a model for a, a public, uh, a public broadcasting system, but online. And so anyway, I'm playing with that a little bit. And I make a lot of videos, mostly they're educational, but educational videos like this one here is uh, is about uh, how to do online marketing, basically. So it's it's also it's actually aimed well towards students, but also aimed for towards professionals. Like I say, most professionals don't understand it, don't understand online marketing. So it's aimed at it's really aimed a little more at professionals than for, at students. But obviously, students become professionals at some point. Did everybody get signed in on, uh, okay, somebody, you guys got skipped. Um, I also, as I mentioned, uh, have been in PR marketing, um, especially when my kids were getting a little bit older in high school and junior high. Uh, I was working at the time at a daily newspaper for the largest chain in America, the McClatchy chain, and uh, as a daily newspaper editor, we wouldn't even go to work until 3 or 4 in the afternoon, which meant, uh, and I took a late shift, uh, well, I came in at the regular time, but I agreed to stay until uh, 1.30 or so uh, to be the last eyes on our newspaper, make sure there were no glaring errors in the newspaper in order to get a two-hour lunch break, which I didn't always get two hours, sometimes we were too busy. But uh, I wanted that two-hour lunch break um, in order to see my kids once in a while. Uh, so uh, during that time when I 
I realized I really needed to see my, my kids a little more often. I transitioned over to uh, uh, corporate marketing and public relations uh, for technical firms. So the technical firms I was working with uh, did um, engineering and architectural design for big projects like schools and prisons and all sorts of stuff, uh, highways, bridges. And uh, as part of that, I also had to publish books because when we would go, when you'd go after a $10 million project, you wouldn't send them a one sheet of paper. You'd send them a book telling them what all you'd done that was similar to what uh, they were doing. And so I used my book publishing and our journalism skills also to be successful in, in PR marketing uh, for, for these technical firms, technical consulting firms. Also, I've used it in politics. This happens to be me. So I, among other things, I did run for city council in our city, and I won that very easily. There are eight people running. Some, some of them ran, uh, spent $10,000 on the campaign. I spent 2000 and had by far the most votes because I knew how to use it, uh, how to publish uh, uh, my promotional materials cheaply, how to write it so that people would read it. Uh, so I wrote journalistically, and I, I, I broke the the uh, you know kind of the fad of just having um, a big graphic and a and a logo, and, and that's about it, and say almost nothing. Uh, this was part of a, a four-page flyer that I produced here, and is done journalistically. This was one I done uh, that I did back in the 1970s. Uh, one of the biggest trends right now in advertising is called native advertising. Anybody want to know by any chance? Anybody know what native advertising is? It's been revived recently by, well, I was going to say it's been revived by Facebook. That probably isn't totally true. Other people have been looking at it too, and other people have instituted it already. But native advertising is to put advertising in, in whether it's an electronic or printed uh, publication or, or site, and make it look like it's mediated content. So in other words, in Facebook, you will see a little word on it that says sponsored. It looks like a regular posting, like anybody's posting. But when it says sponsored, it means somebody paid to put that in there. And that's appearing on, on sites that aren't their friends. It's appearing on your site, and, you, and they're not your friend. Okay, um, And that's native advertising. You put content someplace that looks like it's, you might say organic is the word we sometimes use, that it's natural, and it's not natural. Even newspapers like the Wall Street Journal are now allowing people to pay for, for news. They still put sponsored or paid ad or something on it. Um, but a lot of readers don't understand what they're reading. And that's the a journalistic issue, issue of, uh, related to ethics. Is are we fooling, are we in exchange for money fooling our readers? Now in some countries like Kazakhstan, you can pay for a, a story in the front page anyway or any place. You pay for PR. And they don't market paid advertising or sponsor. They don't market at all. And so that you know, by American standards, is very unethical to do that, to accept money for a news story and put it in a newspaper like a news story or on TV or whatever. That's considered unethical in America, not in Kazakhstan. That's just, that's your normal operating procedure. Um, and a lot of other countries uh, also get, uh, let people pay them for news. Um, but even in America now, they're, they're, that everybody's getting into native advertising, they found it's very powerful. Uh, they, there's ethical questions because we know that a lot of readers don't understand what they're reading. They don't understand that somebody paid for this. Um, so is there still ethical questions? Um, but I used it in, 19, in the 1970s. Uh, I took over this campaign here for this guy named uh, Joe Cotvis. And there were eight people running for mayor of Tampa, Florida, and he was dead last. Uh, but I believed in him. I believed he was the best candidate. And so with one month to go to the primary, I took over his campaign. And we bought ads in the paper, in the daily paper, and the weekly paper. And across the top, it does say, it, you can't read it down there, but across every column at the top, and um, maybe just this one on the bottom, 
the leaf in the top, Harry Collins said, pay political ad, pay political ad, pay political ad, pay political ad. But the supervisor of elections, who was in charge of overseeing all the elections for the government, uh, said he read the page before he realized it was an ad. Um, so he, you know, he should have been alert to it. So it was very effective, uh, and he moved up into uh, for a second uh, second place in the primary. Uh, he went into the general election, and Tampa's a mafia town. I think he was actually defeated by the mafia, not by the electors. Uh, he lost by. Um, just a few hundred votes. Anyway, um, in a very suspicious, very suspicious election. Let's go lower than I want it to go. Okay, so I've used it for that. Um, so I have a lot of experience, a lot of different things. And hopefully that will be of value to you in this class, but also in other classes as we, as we proceed. Uh, we're talking about in our department starting a, uh, a major in uh, PR advertising, and I would probably be teaching some courses in that since, like I said, I've got some background in that, even though I consider myself primarily a journalist. Okay, why I teach the way I teach, let me get into that in a second. Um, first, I want to talk about how our brains work. When you're a baby, you know, in fact, does anybody, how young, does anybody remember when they were four years old? How many people remember when they were four years old? Nobody? I think I might be able to, but I presume that if you don't remember anything from when you were four, you don't remember anything when you were three or two or one, right? Um, we, our memory is a strange instrument, a wonderful instrument, uh, but it had to be built. We had to build it. Um, and that's why you don't have memory of those things, because you didn't have any building blocks in your brain yet to base things on. And you had to learn just a little by little and build those and construct your mind. I compare it a lot to uh, when I was a kid, there was a, 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 a kind of a toy called an erector set. Uh, this is a picture of it here. They were just little pieces of metal, different sizes. And sometimes it also have motors and stuff that you could use, depending on what it is you wanted to, to build. But basically, a little pieces of, of metal with holes in them and, and uh, uh, nuts and bolts. And so you'd piece these things together. Um, and you would build Eiffel Towers and high skyscrapers and all sorts of stuff with this, electric, with this erector set. Our brains are kind of like that. We start fitting things in our brain, and we piece them together. We associate one thing with another thing. And we build our minds very gradually from the time we're born. We start building our, our minds and our memory, our ability to think. And as we build that, we build problems into our thinking. Um, we build mistakes into our thinking. We build biases into our thinking. Because at the time we built them, they made sense to us. Um, and maybe people, uh, everybody signed in? And if you think about it, who are some of the people helping us build that? Our parents, aunts and uncles, grandparents. Then you're young and teachers. Each of them, some of them are wonderful. I mean, they're all, probably most of them are wonderful people. But they also have their biases. And they have their misunderstandings, and they give them to you um, and to me. And so we take these concepts. Every you can, if you think of. Can I borrow your pizza? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, you got. Okay. Don't lose them. Thank you. Um. Anyway, so. Uh, we're piecing concept by concept into our mind and relating one to another. If you don't understand something, that we call it nonsense. And we don't remember it anymore. We don't remember. We don't tend to things that we consider nonsense, we don't remember. They don't fit into our, our construction as we're constructing this, the, our conceptual framework, our, our conceptual framework of reality. If we don't understand it, we reject it, 
you know, it's like a, a piece of this erector set that doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. So I don't, it just doesn't fit. We throw it away. And so that, you know, our prejudices, prejudices and our misunderstandings frequently make us, uh, cause us to make mistakes in our construction. Uh, none of us has a perfect understanding of the world because of that. Uh, we have built in misconceptions. Our concepts, because we've rejected concepts that we didn't understand. They've actually done some some uh, experiments on this, and it's kind of interesting. Um, they did an experiment with college students, and they they brought the students in and they taught them something radically different, very radically different, with which probably nobody agreed. It was true. I mean, by according to scientists, it was true, but something with which it was radically different to all the students. Guess which students did the best at what grasped that concept and were able to uh, repeat it and, on a test and so forth easiest? Smart kids or dumb kids? Well, you probably know I wouldn't be asking the questions if, it's obvious, if the answer was obvious. It was not the smart kids. The smart kids already built their construction. They'd already, they already knew too much. And so in, the, the, so in this test, when they taught them stuff that was radically different than what was in their little their conceptual framework, it was the students who were not good students, who understood it best, and who were able to repeat it months later and, and, and respond to it in a test because it didn't conflict with anything they had constructed yet. They, their, their conceptual framework hadn't been constructed yet in lots of ways. It wasn't as fortified. The more concepts you put in this construction, the more rigid it becomes. Consequently, according to the, one of the great uh, thinkers of, of, of science, he points out that most revolutions in science, something that totally changes our, real, our, our, our reality, so to speak, scientifically, are they by young people or old people, do you suppose? What do you think? Who, who, revolu who leads the revolution in science? Young people or old people? Young people. The old people already have their erectors. Their erector sets too complete. They have too many concepts bolted in. They've created their reality. And now this young whippersnapper says, Aha, you're wrong. And the old guys say, No, it can't be. That's nonsense. And they, direct, they reject it out of hand until the young people convince other young people. And, and they show them the facts. They show them the science. And it's really hard sometimes for the old people to accept the revolution. Um, so that's the same thing that happened to the college students when they did that, did that experiment. The, the smart kids already had a very well-developed conceptual framework. And they start challenging their conceptual framework with something you know, you know, that's revolutionary. The smart kids in college had a harder time grasping these revolutionary concepts or remembering them and accepting them than the dumb kids in class. Um, so that we have to fight against this, by the way. I've spent a lifetime trying to fight against my biases and my, the, my conceptual framework that I've established um, based a lot on my very beloved parents and so forth. You know, I was... Uh, uh, we come by it honestly. Nobody tried to do us any harm. Uh, they tried to teach us what was best. And yet we end up not understanding, so having a hard time grasping other concepts sometimes or understanding other people. So anyway, my point with, with uh, when I'm talking about my blog site, that's one of the problems is, is there's a gr also another scientific concept called groupthink. What do you suppose? Anybody knows what groupthink is? refers to anybody I do want participation if anybody happens to know a group think is basically when you're surrounded by people who all who think like you do then it reinforces the way you think and we tend to to surround ourselves if we have a choice we tend to surround ourselves with people who agree with us uh, there's a, another concept psychological concept called cognitive dissonance and it relates to these, these what I've been talking about. Cognitive dissonance, dissonance is caused, it it's basically hurts your brain to have to face something that doesn't fit into your conceptual framework. 
the cognitive dissonance is hard for us to, to grasp. It's hard, not only hard for us to grasp, hard for us to remember, and even it's a little bit painful to have somebody who disagrees with us sound logical. And they start making persuasive arguments, and it hurts because we have this established framework in our mind, and we, we're, we're comfortable with the way we think. And so when somebody disputes us and does it in a way, in a strong way, it hurts. It's called cognitive dissonance. We don't want to be hurt. And so we tend to stay away from cognitive dissonance. And so we tend to stay away from people that disagree with us. And so they say, that one person said, anybody, you know who Richard Nixon was? Actually, he is the one that actually kind of opened the doors between America and China. He was the president of the United States. But he, got, he basically had to resign because uh, he got in trouble with what we call the Watergate incidents, where he apparently, if he didn't know, he at least covered up uh, the some unethical and, and indeed an illegal things of some of his political operatives in his campaign. Um, and so he ended up uh, having to resign as president of the United States. Well, there's a book that, that says basically that his downfall was groupthink. That he was surrounded by people who had a certain way of thinking. And one of the things they thought was that the Democrats are going to do illegal and unethical things against us. Therefore, we have to do illegal and unethical things against them. And, uh, and there, so they started doing things that crossed the line that ultimately led to him having to resign as president of the United States. Um, but all of us, I remember when I was your age, my first year at the university, I was quite politically active as a conservative in America. And it was a time, it was uh, during the time of the Vietnam War. And there were, there was a lot of discontent about it. Uh, the, uh, indeed, actually revolutionary type sort of actions. The students were shutting down universities and stuff, those who opposed the war. Um, and there was a very anti-American sentiment among many of the university students. Uh, in America. And so I ended up being uh, the head of the conservative group of students, even though I was just a freshman, you know, just a first year student. I had been somewhat politically active before that, and I had been a debater, and so I enjoyed arguing about politics. And so um, they elected me president of this conservative group, and we were, so they set up a, a, a sequence of debates between the head of, uh, of the the kind of revolutionary group, the Students for a Democratic Society, was very, very ultra-liberal. Ones that, in some, like I said, in some universities, shutting down universities, taking over the administration buildings, stuff like that. And so, and then, so we would have debates, uh, myself against the uh, representative from that group. And uh, I remember being puzzled at how they could think the way they thought. Uh, they were so terribly anti-American. It wasn't just about the Vietnam War. It was about so many other things. Um, and I'd go kind of listen in on their, they would have, they always sat in a certain place in, in the uh, student cafeteria. So I'd go listen into their dis their discussions. And I realized they thought in a totally different way than I thought. They saw the, saw the world in a totally different way than I saw the world. Um, and it was very interesting. But it's also interesting that I became, I became friends of the president of, uh, of this other group. She was somebody who I think we both were, wanted to understand each other. And so we talked a lot. On the other hand, her vice president was totally caught in his group think, totally caught into it. And his group think, anybody who didn't agree with their group was an idiot or was, was somebody I mean, right now, there are people in America, kids in America, who would, I think would kill President Trump if they had a chance. They're so radicalized, so anti-Trump, and they feel so justified in their hate of Donald Trump that I think uh, he could be in danger if he were not adequately protected uh, right now. And, and, and I, so, anyway, one time when I was speaking, I was debating, there was a full house. I mean, again, this was they're very uh, content. Tem very, well, I can't even pronounce English myself, um, a very tumultuous time in America. And so there, I remember there were gathered probably a thousand students to hear us debate. 
uh, on their own free will. They nobody sent them there. They want. They were interested in knowing, you know, opinions on, you know, on the world, the the conservative view, the liberal view, anti, you know, pro, somewhat pro. Actually, I wasn't so much pro Vietnam as I was pro democracy. Um, but I, in fact, by then I think by the time I was at the university, I'd kind of decided. If you don't want to win the war, get the hell out of there, <laughs> because I thought the American the, the American leaders no longer intended to win the war. They would not do as necessary, partly because they were afraid of China, but they had decided. You know, here they were in the middle of Vietnam, and they decided they couldn't do certain things. You know, they were restricting themselves and what they could do in the war to such a degree they couldn't win it. So American kids were dying for no good reason because there was no way they're going to win the war without. To some degree, defying China and doing it, not attacking China, but China was basically sitting there, kind of like in the Korean War, also sitting there and saying, "You come too far, we're coming in." And so, America didn't want to do that, so they weren't willing to win the war, basically. Um, so I had become a little bit anti-war myself, but the, the debate was over much bigger things than that. Uh, the the liberal students were anti everything American. Um, and so we debated lots of subjects. But uh, anyway, uh, so I was up there debating the president, and the vice president from her group actually tried to run up on stage to attack me physically, and he had to be restrained by security. So it was that sort of uh, you know, reality in America during that time, very tumultuous, uh, very heated, kind of like that today uh, during this Trump era. But anyway... So group think is basically you're being reinforced by people that think like you think, and you cannot understand the other side. You don't. You, you how can anybody possibly think that? How can anybody possibly vote for Trump, you know, or whatever? Uh, there's that sort of sentiment in America now. That if you voted for Trump, some people who have been wearing Trump shirts or, or you, uh, having a bumper sticker in the car have been attacked physically. For just having voted and supporting Trump, not for having done anything themselves, for example. Um, it's anyway. I'm not happy with what's going on there. Okay, so again, going on to why I teach the way I teach. Uh, it's been said, and and uh, uh, research supports this. Is basically uh, you retain in your mind in education about 10 percent about of what you read. About 20% of what you hear, about 30% of what you see. So most of us are a little more visual learners than we are um, uh, oral, you know, uh, learners from from uh, or, well from hearing anyway, and and just reading. Sometimes we just don't concentrate very well. 50% um, of what we see and hear simultaneously, we start remembering quite a bit. 70% uh, of what However, you remember about 70% of what you say. So why would I have you do presentations? Because I want you to say it. I want you to think about it. And 90% of what you say and you do. And so I also want you to write about it. I want you to, to be involved in your education. If all you're doing is listening to me, you're not going to remember what I'm telling you very much. Um, I want you to be more involved. So my classes are much more student-involved because I want you to know, I want you to remember and be able to develop skills. Um, the, uh, in fact, they've been done, did more specific. That was kind of the general thing, and I, I'm not even sure where that came from, the previous slide. This one has been more specific. Uh, from a lecture, um, you remember 70% in three hours, but you only remember 10% in three days. So, we have both short-term and long-term memory. One of the things I've done some experiments on is uh, memory uh, based on just lectures and quizzes. We tend to, when we have a quiz, what do we do? We cram for it. Cramming has a special place in our brain. Remember it and dump it. Cramming is not long-term memory. I think most of you know that. You've taken lots of quizzes in your lives that, and tests that have been based purely on memory, and a few days later, you know you've forgotten most of that, right? You, you've all gone through that, okay? I knew that too, um, and so 
even in my self-education, my ed education at the university, I tried to take my class in such a way and do such a thing that I would try to embed it a little bit more than that. Um, but and even in my even in my cramming, I do a lot of writing. We the writing helps you remember stuff, and so I would take meticulous. I would make note cards and write and write and write and write. And then I'd memorize the note cards. I'd writing helps embed it a little bit stronger. But bottom line is, if, uh, if you're just listening to a lecture, you might remember quite a bit of it for a few days. But just like cramming for your quiz, a few days later, it's gone. Um, if there's a demonstration, you remember a little bit more in three hours. But more importantly, you remember twice as much in three days. A demonstration and explanation. Quite a bit more in three hours and a lot more in three days. A lot more. Um, we don't, they didn't, in this uh, experiment, they didn't uh, go beyond that. But um, I think that um, if the students are demonstrating and explaining in three hours, obviously, if they're, they, if particularly the ones who are demonstrating and explaining, they're going to remember all of it in three hours, right? Um, but I think they're also going to remember about 85% in three days. I think they'll remember a lot more in three years. I did an experiment myself, and uh, I had some uh, half the students uh, in a large class take quizzes, and half the students in the class write short reports about what we talked about during the week. The students who wrote the short reports at the end of the semester both did better in writing, we had a final paper. They did better in writing. And they did better in the objective test, which was almost surprising. We, even though the, the experiment was just to show, uh, because um, I'm not going to go into all the background, but I wanted we wanted to be able to show that it was OK for that, that professors in a big classroom could use writing as a teaching method, that they could require more writing, uh, because uh, it didn't really matter how much they, how much feedback they gave. And so we found in our experiments uh, over two semesters that in fact the second semester we gave no feedback to the students who did the writing. Not any feedback. Uh, and yet they still did better in the final exam than those who were taking quizzes. Um, so um, the, my belief is that if you write about you know, important, you know, the stuff you need to remember, the whole process of looking at the information, analyzing it, kind of synthesizing it, and expressing it in writing will mean it will stick with you a lot better. That's your long, will become part of your long-term memory, whereas cramming for a quiz is part of your short-term memory. Um, that's gone very quickly. So um, I did some research. I asked. Uh, I've surveyed uh, over, or gotten survey responses from over a thousand uh, media executives, and uh, one of their big complaints is that students don't, the graduates, even from American universities, do not understand the basics of journalism uh, uh, well enough. They're not ready to be professionals yet, and so one of the questions I asked them was, how do we better prepare them? And the response became a cliche. In an open-ended question, many of them wrote exactly this. Write, write, and write some more. Uh, one of my colleagues said, his professor said, you have to write a million words before you can be a good writer. I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. You know, some people are, are naturally good writers, and other people are not. Uh, some people have to work at it. By the way, I'm one that had to work at it. When I was uh, young, um, I was... Well, in a nationalized test in America, I was in the 99 and two-thirds percentile in math. I always struggled with writing. Um, now, struggled in the sense of getting maybe A minuses or B pluses. Not struggled in flunking, but I, it was harder for me than math and science. Uh, but I decided my future was in, in communication, and so I had to work at it. I've written a book on it. I've Done, you know, and I'm an award-winning uh, journalist. But some of us, it's, it takes, it's a little bit harder uh, to become a good writer than those who are just naturally good at it. 
and I was not nat not naturally good at it. I had to work at it. Then I approach it. Uh, I have a method that you all will be introduced to that takes kind of a scientific look at it, how to write, because that's how I taught myself how to be uh, a top tier journalist. Because I had to analyze how do I be a top tier journalist? How do I be an award winning journalist? And so I had to analyze it scientifically and kind of mathematically, I guess, because that's the way my brain thinks. And so I'll introduce that to you over the semester uh, because you are all get to do some writing in this class as well. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's just writing. I think communicate, communicate, communicate could be better said. Uh, so that's another reason why you will do presentations is that you get to work on your other communication skills, not just writing in this class. And I know it's a big class, but and so that puts a lot of burden on me to give grades to for lots of writing and communication assignments. But it's important for you. Uh, if I was a normal professor, uh, I would be giving you only objective question uh, test, self-graded on Moodle and the Moodle e learning system, and I would go home a lot earlier at night and rest and watch TV. Uh, but I'm not normal because I'm a professional and I think of you as my future employees and I don't want you coming to me not knowing how to do your job right and I don't want you going out into the real world and not knowing how to do your job right um, I think we make two promises as a university and my colleagues do not agree with me on this apparently because they don't do what I they don't follow what I tell what I've shown them even scientifically they don't adopt what, I, what I've shown them even scientifically. Um, but I believe that we have, we in essence make two unwritten promises. One is to you. We, we in essence suggest to you that if you come get a degree at our university, whatever university it is, we're going to prepare you for the real world to get a job, good job. Or don't you feel like we've made that promise to you? More or less? Isn't that why you're here? You want to get a good job, right? So you came here thinking that we would prepare you for the real world. Well, according to 90% of the media executives in America, the universities in America are failing. They're not preparing people for the real world. And I've shown that to the to other to the accrediting association and to the other and to the the journalism departments of America, and they've ignored the, the ignored what the employers say. Well, who's going to know more about whether people have been properly prepared than the employers? They bring the, the graduates in and they, these guys aren't ready. They don't know what the heck they're doing. We have to totally retrain them. The university didn't do their job right. Um, and meanwhile, the, uh, the other promise is to your future employers. We kind of suggest to them, if you hire our graduates, We've prepared them for the real world. You can trust us to do this for you. And 90% of the great, the executives and media say, no, you haven't. No, you're failing in that promise. Um, universities are controlled by people that I think are ivory tower people. They have had very little real world experience. And so I fight this all the time. And uh, I try, you know, I fight it in general when we start talking about what should we offer in general education, what should we, how should we teach our classes. I'm fighting right now with the, with the uh, assistant president because they have put such a high regard on documentation of what we're doing in, this cl in each class that it actually is going to hurt the way I teach the class if, they, if I have to do it the way they want me to. Uh, because I'll be spending, I'll be spending unnecessarily uh, every week enough time to put on a piece of paper for you your grade for your week's assignment and a co and some comments on it. And I this semester will have 170 students. I can't do that. It's very hard to do that. When I, at the same time I'm creating the quizzes, I'm doing the teaching, I'm grading uh, papers. Uh, the way I teach is very time-consuming as it is. And they want me to add a whole bunch of layers to this for documentation purposes. When 
all of what I do is in Moodle, is in this electronic. You're going to automatically get your grade. If it's an objective test, you will know your grade in as soon as you close it. Close it. You will know your grade. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. I don't need to fill out a piece of paper, but according to our administration, I do have to fill out a piece of paper for you. Even though you've been told by the Moodle e-learning system what your grade is, I have to fill out another piece of paper for you. And so it may change the way I have to teach this class because filling out pieces of paper is, is when you have 170 students, is very time consuming. And I may not have, I don't have time to do it if I'm going to have to do it every week, every week, every week. And it's not just filling out a piece of paper. I have to also, anyway, there's more to it. A lot of documentation. So uh, I fight with administration all over the world. I'm, I'm an equal uh, discontented uh, employee, I guess, because I think they're wasting time doing stuff that I shouldn't be doing and requiring us to spend time that we shouldn't be wasting uh, when we have important work to do, like teaching and giving you important skills that you need for the future. Um, I wrote a textbook, by the way, on that subject, uh, on the based on the fact that uh, when I, my first college job, my first pro professorial job was many years ago, 1980. Uh, I, I did leave the profession for long enough to become a, a professor. And um, I inherited a book on, or in, I took over a class in advanced news writing. Um, or maybe an advanced reporting. Anyway, it basically it was about advanced reporting and news writing. Um, and the book was like this thick. And I had just came out of, I had just been, I was the editor and publisher of four newspapers coming into this job. I looked at that and I said, that is the stupidest thing I ever saw. Uh, I, I would, as a newspaper editor and publisher, I would hire people who had no journalism training. I would give them a test to see, do you have basic writing skills? Do you, do you have good spelling and grammar? And once I found they had good spelling and grammar, I would teach them how to be a journalist in about one day. Uh, the basics of being a journalist are not that hard. And so consequently, my book is it only has like 50 pages of reading material in it. Uh, and the rest is, let's do this, let's do this, let's do you know, write about this, write about that. It's all about actually putting into practice. There's only 50 pages of reading content uh, because that's all you need. From my experience, what you need is experience. And so when I inherited this book of like 800 pages about how to be a good reporter, I just laughed at it. And there's no way I'm going to use that book for my students. They're going to spend all semester reading and taking quizzes on that book. That's what they're going to do. That In order to get them to read a book, that thick, what do I have to do? I have to quiz them and I have to do something to force them to read the book, right? And so to force them to read this whatever, how many, 600 page book, whatever it was, I would have to give quizzes. And I had to give them time to memorize, to cram and, and use their short term memory to remember all this junk in this book. I'm not saying there's nothing valuable in that book, but I'm saying that's not how you learn to be a reporter. That's not how you do it. And so I immediately, we created a, a news service for local newspapers. I put my students to work, had them sent them out to cover city council and cover local events. We sent their stories to local newspapers. They even, the local newspapers even paid us for them. Uh, we were able to build our own dark room with that, with some advanced dark room, lots of stuff. But I was not going to have them memorize that book. And so I wrote my book, 50 pages, replaced 60 pages, or 600 pages, or whatever. So... Um, okay, another part of my philosophy. What you memorize is almost useless if it's not natural. If you have to cram, stuff you cram, it, it, you won't remember anyway. And how many, how many occupations do you know where what you memorized in university is, is absolutely critical to your success in that, in that field? In the real world, you have to have some basic understanding. But what you're going to memorize, what you remember, is what's important to you. Now, you may remember some because it's important to you. What you remember is what's relevant to you. You're not going to remember anything that you don't think is relevant. It's going to go gone. Um, I remember something from from my bachelor's degree very clearly. Uh, 
something I, I thought was extremely profound. He taught, and by the way, I want you to remember this because I want you to think about it when you do your presentations. In order to understand something, or to, better said, for me to teach you something, and for it to stick very well, for you to really understand something, I need to give you four things. I need to give you the definition. I also have to give you illustrations. Now it can be, you know, print. It can be illustrations like this, uh, but more importantly, illustrations of like examples. So if I say, you know, you should write a the first paragraph of the news story like this, I should show you examples of how to write the first paragraph of a news story. I need to illustrate how a, a, a first paragraph of a news story should look. So I can teach you what a lead is. A lead is that first paragraph, that we call it, a lead. But then I have to show it to you. I have to illustrate it to you. And then I the other things I have to, with a new concept, you have to compare it to other things. What's it like? And you have to contrast it. What's it not like? What's it different than? To really get somebody to understand something, you have to define it, illustrate it, compare it, and contrast it. I remember that for, for literally, uh, I hate this. Well, I had that class in 19, probably 1972. How many years ago is that? You have to be math majors to figure this out. Long time ago. I'm an old geezer. Um, I remember that for all those decades because that was relevant to me. It made sense to me. And I wanted people to understand. I wanted to be able to teach people stuff and help it to click, help it to stick in their minds. So I remember that for decades. Most other stuff I learned from that, I, I got in class, I don't remember any of it. But that I remembered. So if it's really relevant to you, if you really think something's important, you're going to remember it for decades. Now, if you take a job, um, or if you plan to take a job, uh, you're going to learn and remember what you need to learn and remember in order to do the job. And a lot of that probably won't be what you learned in the university. A lot of it won't be. Because they're going to teach you very specifically. You get a job... Um, Let's say you get a job with a radio station. You, you may get a little bit of, of develop some skills here at the university, but they're going to have to teach you their equipment. They're going to teach you their processes, their system. They're going to teach you, you have to learn all the people involved in their organization. You're going to learn their style of reporting if you're going to be doing reporting. You're going to learn a lot of stuff there. We can teach you some basic skills. You're going to learn a lot of stuff on the job, and you will remember it. No matter how stupid you think you are, you remember that stuff. I like to, to tell the story of my two friend, two of my friends in, in high school. One of them was what we call a valedictorian, number one in our class. Never got anything less than an A. The other one was only, grad, was only promoted from class to class because the teachers wanted to get rid of him. Got the lowest grades in our class. Alan and Dennis. Now, they graduated from high school. One of them, just out of mercy, get rid of him. The other one, because he was a top scholar. Alan, the top scholar, he ended up driving truck for a few years. Because he was very, he wanted to figure out what he wanted to do in life. He became a truck driver to think. For years, for several years, he drove a truck to think, what do I really want to do in life? The other friend wasn't good in the classroom stuff. He was good at mechanics. He became a master mechanic. Now, ultimately, my the smart friend became a counselor at a prison. Very important job. Try to help prisoners to, to be successful when they got out of prison. The other one, the stupid guy, he became a college instructor teaching mechanics. He could remember what he wanted to remember. He didn't want to remember math. He didn't really want to remember algebra. He didn't want to remember sociology. He didn't particularly want to remember English. But he wanted to remember mechanics. He became a college instructor in mechanics, a very good college instructor. Now, the other one could have been 
uh, a professor of science if he wanted to be, but he pursued his life his way. He became a, a prison officer, a prison uh, counselor. Which one was more successful? If they're happy, they were both productive. So did the GPA did the GPA represent who was going to be successful in life? The one with the 4.0 or the one with the 1.0? Did their GPA adequately indicate who was going to be successful in life? No, no, no. And it doesn't. There's been lots of studies in GPAs. GPAs have almost no correlation with success in life. One reason is, what is, G, what is the GPA, what part of your mental processes does the GPA best represent? Memory, right? And yet, in the real world, memory is almost irrelevant. You remember what you need to remember. You remember what's relevant to you. We all have memories. I have a, a nephew who is now 40 years old. He has an IQ of about 70. He does not still doesn't know how to read, except just a few words. He doesn't know how to write, except maybe his name. You talk to him about animals, he'll beat any of you. On, on his knowledge of animals, he'll scorch you all. He sits there and watches TV about his nature shows and stuff. He knows everything about animals. He has pet animals, and he, he can... Uh, there was a game show on that my mom uh, was watching with him, and the, the question was asked, uh, where is the Gobi Desert? Well, you all know where the Gobi Desert is. But America, Americans are ignorant of geography. But my mom thought she knew where it was, and she was right. Um, but she wasn't, you know, she was uh, a little bit not sure. But then she asked, uh, or, or, or in their discussion anyway, this 70 IQ nephew of mine who had some brain damage when he was born and a few things. Uh, he said, oh, yeah. That's in China, and they have this animal and this animal there, and told them all about the Gobi Desert um, that my mom wasn't sure about, who, until she took a class from me, had straight A's in college. I, I didn't give her straight A's. Um, she'd never forgiven me. The, um, so she, then she asked the older nephew, who uh, is a computer genius, asked him, Bobby, where's the Gobi Desert? Oh, he thought it was in Africa. He wasn't sure where it was at. He didn't know anything about it. You know, the average America doesn't know anything about it. But my 70 IQ nephew knows, even though he can't read, even though he can't write, he knows because he knows the animals of the Gobi Desert. Um, so that leads to another another idea. There's a, there's a professor in America. I think he was at I think he's at Harvard, but I'm not sure came up with this idea of multiple intelligences. Uh, basically, he thinks there's at least eight, there may be as many 13 types of intelligence. And the way he studied it was um, based on geniuses, child geniuses. Uh, because you have some kids that are at three years old composing music or whatever. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're playing the piano at a level that is almost expert. Stuff like that. You have other kids by four doing algebra and, and and trigonometry. You have kids, you know, you do have kids doing amazing, amazing things. So he said, well, if if it's possible for a kid who's three or four years old to be thinking like an adult in this area, if there must be a part of the brain that controls this. And every of us have it, but they just haven't tapped into it yet. And so he figured, you know, there's some, you know, math is certainly an area, there's that, there's, but some of the intelligences are not, are absolutely not encouraged by universities. One of them is social intelligence. How to get along with people. How to negotiate. How to make friends. That's called social intelligence. My brother, my younger brother has social intelligence. Lots of social intelligence. Um, he dropped out of university after his first year. Um, in, in high school, he started a fire in the chemistry lab. 
um, you know, goofing around with his friends. Uh, he would, um, in, in America, some of the ceilings are kind of made out of a, a, a uh, I'm not sure how, it's kind of a cardboard. So he would sharpen his pencil and see if he could stick the pencil into the ceiling. I mean, you know, he was a little bit ADHD, a little bit attention deficit, a little bit so, too socially inclined. Um, so he got pretty mo mediocre grades, dropped out of the university. But because he has social intelligence, he became extremely successful in sales. And he also, he could learn stuff that was important to him, so he learned how to be a good administrator. He learned how to be a good marketer. Um, he owns an insurance company, and he's worth over $10 million. I'm worth about $10. I have a PhD. I'm worth $10. He's worth $10 million. Who's smarter? You know. Um, smarts is not based on GPA. Uh, and we can be very smart in something that is not at all rewarded by universities or by high schools or for any any level of school uh, because they are stuck in this kind of somewhat primitive uh, reality that if you can't memorize it, you don't know it. Not true. Not relevant. It's just not relevant. So my classes, I want to be more experiential, less memory oriented, although I am going to have some quizzes just because the, the, the number of people, I will have quizzes but they will be short quizzes and basically easy quizzes to make sure my only purpose in doing the quizzes, first off, in order to give you a grade. If I had my way, I, I, I wouldn't eliminate grades, but there's a, an idea that uh, how many of you know uh, uh, Khan Academy? How many of you, anybody familiar with Khan Academy? You should be. You should become, look it up in Google. Khan Academy was built, made by an American whose family came from Bangladesh. And Khan Academy is an amazing tutorial site for particularly for high school level education. I think it's going down to, to lower levels and going up above high school also. He's an amazing, he was a, uh, he was in finance. Uh, he was like in the stock market or something, but he, his, his nephews wanted him to teach them some math. So he started doing video tutorials for his nephews, and now he, he got a like he got hundreds of millions of dollars from Bill Gates and so forth. And he has this massive website that teaches everything. Uh, he's an amazing teacher. Um, but uh, anyway, what was I going to say? I lost my own train of thought. Often cut. Anyway, um, there's um, oh, what he was saying was that he thinks there should only be two grades, or basically one grade, you could say. That is A or keep learning, basically. A or keep learning. Until you until you understand what you're supposed to learn, you haven't learned it, right? And, and, and worse still, what I found in my own life, I, I started getting into computer-based education in 1994. Um, and so I also have some expertise in that area. Uh, and what I, I, I had a daughter who was very mediocre in school. She was like in third grade at the time. And she was very doing just average work. And uh, she was also socially more, had more social intelligence than focus, let me put it that way. She didn't have a lot of focus in the classroom, kind of like my brother. And so uh, she was very mediocre. And uh, I was... Uh, uh, introduced to this this computer-based system that, that a company had been, spent $80 million on developing. Did an incredibly good job with it. Uh, hired a whole bunch of master teachers and how to really teach people. But anyway, what and it was self-paced, so you could do it at your own pace. Uh, you would If it saw that you understood something, it let you go on quickly. If you didn't understand it, it might go backwards and, and give you some tutorials with and so forth. So I had her doing this after school. And after one month, uh, her teacher apologized to us. Her teacher said, I didn't know your daughter was one of my best students. We just had a nationalized test, and she got the top score. Well, what had happened is that she had, because she wasn't paying attention all the time, she had a lot of holes in her understanding. And when you get a, when you get a hole in your understanding, what happens? What, what, does that, what happens when you try to learn something else? 
you can't learn something else very well because we tend to, to learn sequentially. And so if you don't learn, if you haven't learned what you already needed to know, you can't learn very much in the future. So if you're not concentrating, that's a problem. You have a question? Yes. If, you, if somebody, somebody has gone like computer and you need to go into the restroom, uh, I'm going to continue, but this will be on, on video. You, if you think you lost something, let, you know you can come back to it. But uh, we're getting close to the end of the class, so I'm going to continue. I'll try to. In fact, if somebody wants to remind me to give you a break, I'll give you a break midway. But I, at this point, uh, uh, I think it's kind of late to do that. So, anyway, so one of the things I've I've come to realize actually a lot of some of the things that are most important in teaching, computers could do a lot better job of uh, because they can do it individually and teach you what you need to know, go back and plug holes and stuff. Uh, but in our classroom setting, what we do is we teach you, you get a C, you didn't understand everything, but we kick you on to the next class. Um, and that's, you know, what uh, Khan says is that doesn't make any sense, and he's right. It doesn't make any sense. Um, if you don't understand it, you shouldn't be going on. You should stay until you learn it. Until you learn it. Maybe it's not an A, maybe a B, whatever. You need to learn what you're supposed to learn if it's important to learn at all. Maybe you don't need the class at all. But if the class is important, you need to learn it. Otherwise, why are we taking the class? You know, so you need to know what... So anyway, his idea is basically pass or fail. Either you know enough to pass it or you keep going. Or pass and whatever you want to call it, incomplete. You keep going until you learn it. Uh, what we, what I believe is this is the priority, my priority in education. Number one is attitude. Um, if you, and when I say attitude, uh, it's not just a positive attitude. Positive attitude does correlate more highly with your success in life than does GPA, by the way. Just a positive attitude. But attitude is, for me, I, I, I think of attitude as being beyond that. Um, and, in fact, I'll go on and, well, no, I guess I'll stay at that one. Um, so attitude is also work ethic. Are you really willing to work hard to achieve your goals? Is it worth it to you? Um, why are you here? And understanding why you're here and, and do you appreciate the opportunity you have here? Do you, do you have... Uh, goals that you want to achieve that motivate you to, to work hard, so forth. These are all part of your attitude. Um, and those with, with a positive attitude in that way, an attitude of, of, uh, of dedication and so forth. In fact, there was a, a TED.com in another class. I'm going to teach a class. Some of you may be in it. I don't know. A class called Success, Success Strategies. And one, I'm going to have you, those that are in that class, uh, watch one video that was on TED.com. Uh, where this uh, researcher has done a lot of research on what is the difference between those who achieve success and those that don't. And uh, she comes up with one word she calls grit. Uh, those who have the grit to stick it through, those who have the grit to get the A if necessary, even if it's not relevant, and the GPA doesn't matter, <laughs> those who are willing to, to stick to it and to work a little bit harder. Um, it relates, however, also to some other research previously um, about what's called delayed gratification. Are you willing to delay your gratification? In other words, are you willing to sacrifice your time now to excel later? Uh, delayed gratification is highly, highly related with success in life, uh, as is her grit. Uh, for example, and this, this is kind of disturbing. I hope I don't disturb you with this. Uh, but um, they did a, a Stanford professor many years ago did a did a test on five year olds, four or five year olds. I can't remember. I think it's five year olds. Um, and he put a marshmallow. You know what a marshmallow is? Uh, people from China in this area don't know what a marshmallow is. But it's a little white thing. Uh, it's made. It's kind of soft and squishy. Uh, there is some uh, some cookies downstairs and they that have marshmallow in the center like chocolate on the outside and kind of squishy inside, a sweet, made mostly of sugar. Anyway, a marshmallow in, in its original form in the West, anyway, is just a square, like this square, 
and it's white. And anyway, this researcher put a marshmallow on a plate in front of, of a bunch of kids individually and said, if you can wait 15 minutes and not eat that marshmallow, I'll come back and give you another marshmallow. So you'll, you can eat two marshmallows instead of one. And then he left the room. Uh, most of the kids could not wait 15 minutes for the second. Of course, they're five years old. You say, well, so what? They're five years old. Uh, but he then tracked those kids. The most successful kids were the ones who were willing to wait 15 minutes for the second marshmallow. That's kind of disturbing in the sense that if you can judge somebody's future by what they, about whether or not they'd eat a marshmallow when they're five years old, uh, that's a little bit disturbing. But they, uh, the researcher is saying, basically the, the, this other, the grit researcher is saying what she's working on is to help people to understand this and help people to learn. It's not like you can't delay your gratification. There's nobody in this room who can't change their attitude. Attitudes can be changed. And you can change your attitude. If you're one who hasn't had delayed gratification, who uh, likes to party instead of concentrate, uh, or whatever, if you don't have grit, you can you can have grit if you want it. Now, it, cha it does require that you work on yourself a little bit. But you can develop grit. You can develop delayed gratification. And you need to understand how important it is. Uh, because throughout your life, if I... It's kind of like, again, Alan and Dennis. Dennis was told all of his life he was a, he was a failure. All of his life, teachers, I, I admire Dennis far more than I admire Alan. I love Alan. He's a good friend. I really admire Dennis. Because for 12 years in an American school system, he was told he was an idiot. And yet he became an instru a college instructor. I admire the grit he had. Now, he maybe didn't apply that grit in the, in the classroom in, a, in, a, in the most constructive way, and maybe he could have done more. But to be able to withstand that onslaught of, of identification, you are an idiot. You are an idiot. You are an idiot. You're an idiot for 12 years. And come out of that with any self-esteem and any thought that he could become successful and become a college instructor, for heaven's sake. That's amazing. That's amazing to me that he was able to do that. He was able to do that because he did somewhere in there have grit. Somewhere along the line he realized, I'm not an idiot. I really can be good at something. I can be really good at something. And he became good at that something. Enough, he became a college instructor. Then. So attitude is controls so many other things. Um, communication skills are also extremely important even if you're not in communications. I had, uh, I mentioned I was doing the PR marketing for two engineering consulting firms. And in both cases, it was interesting, I did, not, I did not prompt this discussion. But in both cases, the CEO of both companies came to me and said, Ken, I wish I'd taken more communication courses. Because even though my engineering skills are obviously vital to my work, that's not the key to success in engineering. The key to success in engineering is communications. That's why I'm CEO, but I could be better. I could be more than CEO. I could be CEO of a bigger company. I could do, I could do so much more if I had taken more communication courses. That's what they told me. This is, I mean, there's hardly anything in, in any anything in academia more unrelated to communication than engineering. But the CEOs of two engineering firms said that's what they needed to be more successful. Not more engineering, more communication skills. So communication skills for everybody, to me, and developing your, your not just your writing skills, but your, your ability to speak and so forth is really important for you to be successful, even if you were to be, wanted to be an engineer, but especially if you're in the communication industry, obviously. Um, it, it's vital. Um, computer, in this day and age, I'd put computer skills next. Because computer skills can overcome a, a myriad of weaknesses. Yeah, there's, there's computer programs for everything nowadays. If you have terrible uh, grammar and spelling, you know, even within Word, they have a spelling and grammar checks. Then there's more sophisticated uh, software than that. Uh, so 
you know, uh, it's uh, my my stepson is a student here. He's uh, just in the foundation program. My stepson went to a uh, a special high school in Kazakhstan. My wife is is Kazakh, and in their high school, they did high level math, and they were never allowed to use a calculator. Well, here, he's come here, he's, he's taking math in the foundation program, and he doesn't know how to use a calculator. Uh, so he's, he's having to learn, you know, but he knows way more, for, he has all these formulas memorized. Why? Did it do him any good? When he, if he were to be an engineer, for example, in it, all the formulas for engineering memorized, does that make him smarter than somebody with a calculator? Probably not. You know, maybe he may understand a little bit better because he, he memorized all of those. You know, his school forced him to memorize all of those formulas. But if you have a calculator sitting on your desk, all those formulas become kind of taking up a lot of space in your brain unnecessarily, unless it helps you understand it better, how to employ it better. Um, and that's true with a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, the computers are able to do so much for us now. The more programs you learn, the better. And the more programs you learn, the easier it is to learn more programs. And so uh, it just it, it's feeds on itself. You should not be afraid of computers. I mentioned I gave my mom the, her first not A, uh, for which she hasn't forgiven me because I got her to take a computer class from me. And, she, and just like in learning science or getting new science ideas, older people have a hard time learning new skills. And it's the first time she'd ever used a mouse, about 1987, something like that. Um, Need a shorter class? Uh, do you have to go someplace else? Yes. Uh, um, well, I need to finish what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm supposed ten, to have ten, five, ten minutes. Oh, yeah, wow. five minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's my normal time. Be five minutes. I should be done in five minutes anyway. Okay. Anyway, um, so she didn't know how to use a mouse. She was afraid of it. Uh, like as a real mouse. And so I was trying to teach her desktop publishing and she couldn't do it. My, I had my wife, my ex-wife now, in the class. She couldn't do it. She didn't get a very good grade either. I had my 14-year-old daughter in the class. She, she, she didn't care if she ruined the computer. And my mom was afraid she'd destroy the computer by hitting, clicking the wrong thing. My daughter, she didn't care if she'd destroy the computer. So whatever. She just you know, learned it intuitively and she made, uh, she's made a lot of money with her computer skills since then. But uh, so it's uh, okay. I think I misunderstood a little bit of what they wanted. Okay. Um, anyway, so um, so computer skills are extremely important, uh, and don't be afraid of it. Uh, and, the, and again, the more not only will it help you be successful uh, to learn one, you know, by their their individual uh, capabilities. But again, the more you learn, the easier it is to learn. And this, in this day and age, you will have to be lifelong learners. There's no question. To be successful, you have to be lifelong learners. It was, it was, it was vital to me, and it, was, it leads to success in any age, in any era. Uh, being a lifelong learner has been pivotal to success. The person who has graduated from university and thought they were all done learning is, is going to be in trouble, has always been in trouble. But this day and age, with things that are changing so rapidly, absolutely. One reason why I tell students, don't major in something you don't want to major in. Uh, I, I, I don't know why. It seems to be economics primarily. But I've had a number of economic students say they're economic students because their parents wanted them to be. And they didn't want to be. Um, and I said... With all, due respect to your parents, you're not going to be a successful economist. If, if you don't love economics, you will not be a successful economist because you will not be a lifelong learner. As soon as you graduate, as soon as you get your degree, you're going to say, ah, I'm done. 
and you're never going to want to see it again. You're never going to want to read another economics book. You're not going to be a lifelong learner. And so all those people, even those that got worse grades than you in university, are going to pass you up. They're going to leave you in the dust because you don't love it. And if you don't love it, you can't be good at it, uh, which is kind of uh, the next slide here. Do you love what you're good at, or are you good at what you love? What do you think? I mean, I think there's a little bit of truth to both of them, don't you? I mean, it is. If you if you're good at something, it's nice. It's it's kind of easier to love it. On the other hand, I divorced math when I was in high school. I I was good at it. I loved it, but I didn't love it as much as communication. I wasn't as good as com at communication. But I loved what I wanted to do with communication. I had this goal. And so I became an expert in communication because I loved it. Um, so I think there's some truth to both. But I think it's an important question. And it definitely is important to somebody who's in a major they don't love. If they're in a major they don't love, they shouldn't be in that major. Uh, no matter what their parents say, they, uh, they maybe the need to send the parents to talk to me uh, because you will not be successful in a major you don't love. Because again, going back to being a lifelong learner in this day and age, you have to love love it to keep learning. You can't stop learning. So if you don't love it, you won't keep learning. You won't be successful. Um, I had one student in economics got her degree in economics. She went ahead like her parents wanted her to, and she I, she took one class from me. One of the best writers I've ever had, a, a brilliant writer. And she came into my class kind of very negative attitude, too. Um, and so I basically, I first off had to get her to believe in herself. I, I, I maybe even hyped how good she was, maybe a little bit more than it really was, but she was good. And I let her know she was good. Um, and so as soon as she got her economics degree, she went out and got a job in a magazine. <laughs> and see, she's very good at it. Um, and, you know, because that's, you know, that's what she loved. She'd been writing, doing poetry all of her life and stuff. She's good, a good wordsmith, good with words. And finally she got her degree for her parents and she went out and got a magazine job. So, but how hard is it to remember what is useful and relevant? It's not hard. You don't have to cram for stuff that's useful and relevant to you. And so it's kind of sad that we spend all our time cramming stuff uh, for classes that we will not remember that stuff because it's not useful and relevant to us. If it's going to be helpful, useful, and relevant, then it shouldn't be hard to remember it. And so I hope you do remember a lot of stuff in this class, but I hope it becomes useful and relevant. And so one thing I do, even though we have these textbooks and you guys can help me teach it, I'm going to also teach a lot of stuff about, I'm going to try to adapt them a little bit and teach you when we talk about PR and advertising, I'll teach you some stuff about real world PR and advertising. Um, we talk about internet. I'm going to teach you some real world stuff about how to be successful with the internet. Um, we're talking about books. I'm going to teach you some real world stuff about how to be successful as a book author, if you ever wanted to be, um, and so forth. And we're talking about newspapers. I'm going to teach you some real world stuff about being successful in newspapers. And that's where my background comes in. It's nice to have a background where I can teach you from a, a, a background of experience. Um, and so we're going to talk about not just about the history. Actually, I would just assume they do away with this class. I don't like the title, and I don't like what they what they think they should teach in this class. Um, and so I'm going to make it as practical as possible, help you develop, develop as many skills as possible, help you to develop as many professional insights as possible. I'm going to destroy this class <laughs> from within, uh, so to speak. Uh, so... Uh, you know, there are things to, that are, should be interesting. I hope they're interesting to you uh, from the textbooks. Uh, but I hope to make them more meaningful to you than just history and culture and stuff that you may not perceive as being real real important right now. Um, I guess, you got, how, do you all have classes after this? How many have a class now? Uh, I'm trying to satisfy our videographer here. We can maybe stay a little bit longer <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, maybe just uh, let me just go into this next slide here. 
Um, attitude, again, it's more than a positive attitude. It's, it's passion. It's a sense of mission. If you have passion and a sense of mission, nobody has to tell you to work hard. Um, if you have a strong work ethic, uh, but if you really have passion, it's not work. I put in I'm a workaholic. I showed you all the things I've done. That wasn't work. I grew up on a farm. I had to go out and, and, and work in the hot sun for, you know, as a kid, I was probably from the time I was about four or five, I was working 12 or 13 hour days out in the sun on the farm. This isn't hard. <laughs> what I do now is not hard. What I did then was hard. I learned what hard work was as a kid. This isn't hard. For two reasons, though. Farming wasn't hard for my dad. My dad loved farming. He was just a natural born farmer. He loved it. Um, so that wasn't hard for him. Farming was hard for me. I didn't love it. To me, it was just a lot of hard work. Um, so to me, working two jobs or doing a lot of it work outside of my, my paid job is not, that's not work. That's hobby, fun. I don't know what it is. Goals, mission, passion. It's all those things because I love it. Um, I am goal driven, but a lot of that stuff I do, I don't have any idea how it's going to be employed because I love it and I don't have an immediate belief that it's going to be monetarily uh, rewarding. Um, I mentioned I, I did get some monetary reward by getting involved in computer-based education uh, in, 19, in 1994. Um, I made a little bit of money from that, but then that uh, consulting work dried up for a period of time, and I did some other consulting work and did a bunch of other stuff, started developing other skills as the, te as the technology moved on. Never got compensated for most of it, uh, but kept doing it out of curiosity, out of passion. Uh, in my last job at Kazakhstan, then I, they made me the, the distance learning coordinator. I'd never been trained in distance learning. I've actually never been trained in video, although I've made hundreds of online videos. I've never trained in that. Uh, I never learned how to make, I never was trained in how to do web pages, although I've done dozens of web pages, and I have probably at least a dozen web pages right now that I maintain. I never was trained in that. Um, self, mostly self-trained uh, and just experimented and tried stuff because I was curious, had a passion, had a purpose. Um, and that will be true for you in your lives. With whatever you have a passion for, you'll become good at. Um, it may be mechanics, I don't know. you know, But whatever it is that, you're, that you have a passion for, you'll be good at it. Um, I think most people who end up in communications actually do have a passion in it because it's not usually the first choice of parents. Parents usually say, like economics or science or something, math, they want you to do something harder. Um, so hopefully those of you that are in this class actually do have somewhat of a passion for it. And all of you can be successful. I've told you, I, I you know, it's, yeah, you have to have some basic skills and in, in uh, your you know, you may not be successful in English, for example. If you struggle at English, well, probably most of you won't be journalists in English. And so that's one of the failings of a, of a university like this and a university like KEMEP, where I was at before. We train students in an English-based class, and they're not going to be doing their work in English, probably. Um, but... Uh, I, so I try to teach it, and I try to grade it in such a way that it doesn't depend totally on your English skills. Uh, when, I, when I evaluate your writing, for example, I want to see that you have structured it properly, even if you make mistakes grammatically. Now, I do ask that it be grammatically good enough that I can understand what you're trying to say. Um, and so, you know, you may want to use words grammar check to see what, what you're doing wrong, and so forth. But but I, 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 I understand that many of you will not be doing your your careers in, in English. Um, and so I try to overlook some grammar and even spelling problems. Well, spelling is a little bit, again, where it has a spelling check, too. So you should check your spelling, too. But uh, So I try to overlook some of that. 
but you should be able to learn the nature. For example, I want your leads to be 25 to 35 words long, no longer. I want them to write. I want you to write simply, not complex sentences. Avoid compound sentences. Avoid long compound sentences. Avoid words that you don't control. Try to use simpler vo vocabulary. I try to teach you how to actually be journalistic. That's what we learn in, in America. To be good journalists, you use simpler vocabulary. We try to, in American newspaper, we try to write at an eighth grade level, the grade of, uh, of the level of about a 14-year-old, because we want everybody to understand what we're writing. And so we can write about nuclear fusion, but we have to write about it at a 14-year-old level. Um, and so that's, that's what we teach in journalism in America, and that's what, what I expect of you here is to write simply. Write simple word, use simple the simpler words that you know and understand and control um, that you're sure about. Write simpler sentences that are not don't get confusing, um, and uh, you know write uh, clearly. And uh, anyway, so we'll get more into that later. Okay, done a lot of talking. Sorry, it's all on record. Um, there do. Um, well, some of these main things, I, I, one last thing real quick. I'll go over some, I haven't gone over the syllabus, so I'll do that in the next class. Um, at the end of each PowerPoint, I will give you some questions. And this whole entire PowerPoint will go on Moodle. It sounds like maybe I may have to teach you a little bit of Moodle. Um, and I guess I better probably start in the next class to give you some instruction on Moodle as well. Uh, I'm a little concerned why the university hasn't set up a Moodle class for you. but. Um, anyway, some of the questions, this, these are the sort of questions I would expect. I didn't put in the, the possible answers, but these are the sort of questions that I also expect from you, each of, one of your jobs, when you do a presentation, we write some questions. And I want them to be fairly simple questions, like which of the following has Dr. Kim not done during his, his career? And I'll you look at that page and see what I have done. And so I'll probably throw in there something like uh, TV, TV increments. Well, I've not been a TV anchor. It's not on the list. Uh, so that will be the, the answer you'll choose. Uh, Dr. Kim compares our mind structure to what? Well, I'll, one of the, the right answer will be uh, an erector set. You know, uh, so you may not remember erector set by name, but you'll remember when you read it. You know, so remember erector set. Uh, and we'll go over some of this other stuff too. But priority, attitude, attitude, attitude. Is what number one priority? Attitude. Last priority? Memory, memory, memory. That nah, don't need it. So anyway, so th this is what I expect you to do too: is give us questions and make them reasonable questions. Questions. Uh, some of you maybe might say, oh, "Why do I need to know what you've done?" Well, maybe that's not that important, but see if you're paying attention anyway. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I will see you. I think our next class is on Wednesday, right? in another room. I don't know why they put us in different rooms in our classes. I, d I hate that, but we'll see you. Thank you.